We got a real mom in the family car to do an experiment. We put a week of her family smelly stuff all in at once to prove that Febreze car vent clips could eliminate the odor. Then we brought her family to our test facility to see if it worked. Take a deep breath. Tell me what you smell. Something blindfold fresh. Off. A beach. Oh, a clean oh. house. My new car. Go ahead and take your blindfolds off. Oh. <laughs> Look at all this garbage. Y'all remember those commercials? I actually tried this experiment, and it was this time of year, it was really cold, and I was a youth pastor, and one thing I loved doing is I'd pick up groups of teenagers in my old Toyota Camry after school, and we'd take them to Bible study, uh, but we would always, or they would always want to stop at Taco Bell, and uh, when we got to the Bible study location, I was always in a hurry, so I'd say, okay, everybody, we got to go, get out of the car, just leave whatever, leftovers, Rappers, I said, it's fine, we'll worry about it later. The problem was, later, the next time I happened to pick up kids in the car, I'd say, hey guys, come on in, it's a little messy, I said. Just push whatever out of the way. And they did. Under the seats, throw in the back of the car, it's okay, we just gotta go. And it was fine this time of year, because it's winter, very cold, I drove around a fridge, uh, but eventually, spring happens which is good news. And every single spring, I was in doing youth stuff before I got a minivan. Um, all the stuff that was under the car seats would start to defrost. And it would stop hibernating and you'd find this unmistakable aroma. And let me tell you from experience, there's no amount of air freshener that fixes that. Uh, I sprayed it all, I left it all, it covered up the problem. But you know that the only thing that works with that sort of problem is dealing with the problem. So every, every spring, I'd get in my car and I'd stick my hands under the seats and just deal with whatever icky things that the air freshener couldn't quite cover up. Because covering up problems isn't the same thing as fixing problems. We're in a series called Under the Rug uh, because some of the biggest, messiest problems you will ever encounter in your life are problems that we naturally cover up and avoid fixing. Like it's really natural to avoid symptoms. It's natural to ignore the red flags. We all like to pretend that everything is okay or it's too complicated or we, we don't want to go down there. So we just cover it up. We spray air freshener over the stink and then we wonder why things don't get better. Now, 1 Corinthians is this fascinating and I'll be honest, at times it is uncomfortable because God picks up the rug, he sticks his hand under the car seats and pulls out and deals with some of the things we all would prefer to just cover up. God, God deals with it. The Lord, through the mouth of the Apostle Paul, just deals with it goes to the uncomfortable places because God is not afraid to open cans of worms. And I am so excited to talk about this, even though uh, each of these things are a little bit awkward. Going there has a potential to change things, to shake us up a little bit from what we think is normal, because look, we normally cover up things that might be real problems that might be holding us back from what God has for us. And by the way, what does God have for us? God has something better for you in mind. In fact, let me just remind you of what life as a Christian should be like. We read this last week. This is an opening line in the letter uh, to the first Corinthians, uh, or I should say through the first letter to the Corinthians. Paul writes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. You see what's going on here, right? This is, this is amazing, right? I mean, don't take this for granted. If you're a Christian, this should be your experience. You're called by God. God, is, you see those words there? God is making you holy. It's, it's, it's the word sanctified here. In other words, people who follow Jesus should start looking like Jesus. People should look at us and go, man, they, they, they're so loving. They're moral, there's ethics, there's empathy. Christians have a desire to love their neighbors 
and make this world a better place. And here's the part that most people miss. Christians are called to be all of that, not just as individuals by themselves, but you are called to be, you see what it says there? Together with all of those everywhere who also follow Jesus. And then by the time you get to chapter 12, if you've read 1 Corinthians, you're probably familiar with this. The Apostle Paul introduces this body metaphor. And he uses this to explain what's obvious, that people are different. And the Apostle Paul says, different parts of your body, they they have different preferences, they like different things, they like doing different things. If you ask an ear and an eye what's really important, what makes them excited, what makes them upset, you'll get very different answers. But a body needs differences to be healthy. This is, I mean, this is an amazing image, and I I hope you've gotten this. Uh, Like, like maybe, maybe you're like me, maybe you've imagined what it would be like. And we sang lots of songs about Jesus coming back. But have you ever wondered what it'd be like if Jesus were here? Like God in a bodily form. Christmas, you may know, celebrates the incarnation, uh, which just means God showing up in, in a body, the flesh. And you kind of go, whoa, God is here with a physical body. That, that's what Christmas is. Paul says, well, it's like he says, okay, I got good news and bad news for you. Here's the good news The good news is that Jesus is still here in bodily form, which is great. Paul says, if you look around, you should be able to see Jesus here on earth doing Jesus sorts of things, things that seem impossible. Like you should see our world better off. God should be glorified. Neighbors should be loved. Like Jesus is here in the flesh. And you might be, this is amazing. Uh, Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? Where is the whole body of Christ thing, uh, which is the bad news, right? Because uh, Paul says, stop like looking around. Jesus in bodily form, the body of Christ is you. Oh, <laughs> like this is uh, not great news because let's be honest, the universal church looks like a unhealthy body. And no matter how much we like to spray air freshener or sweep things under the rug, here's the hard truth. Christ followers, I mean, to be honest, for the most part, we're not having the impact on this world that Jesus, I believe, would have us. So the Apostle Paul lifts up the rug. He tells us what's wrong. What are the things that are stopping people like you and me from being part of this functional, powerful body of Christ that God has to change the world. Like, what is the problem with us? And the first thing he said, this is last week, the problem is what he calls division and strife. That's, that was last week. In chapter 1 of Corinthians, division and strife is about differences in opinion and conviction and preferences and philosophy. It's a really specific problem. You've got body parts sort of amputating themselves over in, in chapter one. Personal politics. You got people who are fans of Paul or Apollos or Cephas and the, the whole community is ripped apart. And by the way, what do you call it when a body part rejects the other one, another part of the body? I, I have no idea. I'm, I'm asking you. Uh, I'm not a doctor. I do know this. If this happens to you, if like one of your organs starts rejecting your body, don't call me, call the doctor, get to the hospital. Like if your heart says, I can't deal with these arteries anymore uh, and don't get me started on what the mouth is eating. I, I, I have no idea what, what, what kind of voice a heart uses, right? Uh, but if your body is doing that, uh, you might die, right? This is serious. At the very least, you won't be able to do what you're supposed to be doing. And that's what Paul says. Division and strife is a serious obstacle to what God has called his body to accomplish. And I I, I think I say to our shame, 2,000 years later, most of church history is in one effect the story of Jesus' mission being held back because of all the energy wasted on church splits, friendly fire, slander, division, strife over things far less important than the gospel and far short of the glory of God. 
And Paul says, this is one of our problems. This should not be. So Paul says, stop hiding it. It's not healthy. Febreze isn't going to cover up. It's not solving things up. Let's deal with it. And so he does. That's what we said last week. Uh, but there's, if you read 1 Corinthians, you see another kind of division that Paul also warns about. This is different. This isn't groups dividing over politics or uh, arguing unfairly. This isn't about uh, conviction or style or preferences. This is a very personal and hurtful kind of conflict. And Paul just goes through it. Uh, it, it shows up really explicitly in chapter 6. Paul writes, if any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Now, I'm going to be upfront about what I'm about to do. In Corinth, there is a very narrow, specific instance of a wider problem. And I've chosen, instead of talking about the narrow example, I'm going to talk about the bigger problem because this is something huge that people cover up and ignore. The issue that Paul brings up is conflict. The Greek word uh, translated dispute here, it literally means thing, which is super helpful. The text says, if you've got a thing with someone else, which it's whatever, uh, the NIV calls it a dispute because it started somewhere and it's escalated all the way up to the courtroom. It's a personal thing. Somebody miscommunicated, someone hurt someone's feelings, and it gets bigger. They've called the cops. They've called the lawyers. They end up, or they serve papers. They end up with a judge and a jury. Whatever it is, this is a problem. And Paul thinks it's a big problem because by the time you get to verse 5, God says, I say this to shame you, which is a clue that it's bad. <laughs> like, and then he says, is it possible if there's no one among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? Or verse 7 the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? This is a fascinating example in Scripture, a very specific problem, very specific solution. But today, instead of going, like, instead of diving deep in, into the Corinthian problem, I want to go a little bit wider into the problem problem. Because there's lots of different kinds of conflict, right? And, and there's lots of stories you could tell of how things have been go- done the wrong way. Again, I, I thought of what story to start with. You know, the, one example is a, a classic one. Uh, kids conflict with each other after their parents die dividing an estate. That happens all the time. Or you might think about any number of conflict between in-laws or kids or business partners where there's anger and insults and stuff under the surface. And you may have a story to tell about parents who say things they don't mean or kids who just hold it all in too much and, until they finally explode. I'm not going to tell you any one specific narrow story about conflict because uh, I can't pick just one. In fact, I'll bet each of you could probably, if you went around the room, you could all tell a story about conflict. You could tell stories about relationships being broken by arguments, and you don't even remember how it started. In fact, it is hard to remember or imagine a world, or or as Tripp starts off, a city where conflict didn't get so far out of hand to ruin relationships. I'm going to give you a tool today, and this is uh, not mine. I didn't write this. It's a tool that I I come back to fairly often. You'll find it in your handout. It is way broader than what we find in 1 Corinthians. But if you find yourself ever in a conflict, or if you're in one right now, and if you want to figure out how to do better than you are now, this is going to help you. It's from a book by Ken Sandy, who's done a a whole thing about making peace. Uh, I'd recommend his book. Uh, Most of what I'm about to say is right in your text, or right in your handout here, What I'm not going to do is I'm not going to go into all the scripture examples. You can do that later. But Sandy basically says you can sketch out all the ways that people respond to conflict this way. Everybody responds to conflict. Everybody got conflict. And we respond naturally in one of these many ways. You see it's a, you call this thing a hill. And on the left side of the hill, you find escape responses. 
On the right side, you find attack responses. And in the middle, the hard place to be is what he calls peacemaking responses. Like here's what gets really hard. Whenever you encounter conflict, when you get sinned against, insulted, all of us have this gravitational pull to go down to one side of the hill or the other. Like some people, we don't like conflict. Like some people, I'll be honest, I, I'm, I'm, this, is my, my, this is my default mode. I don't like conflict. I don't want to be in a confrontational thing. I don't like the awkward conversations, naturally. I'm working on it. And a lot of people like me want to escape it and at the same time pretend everything's okay. I get it. We just want to spray Febreze and cover it all up. So we cover up conflict real conflict instead of dealing with it. And if that's, if that's your natural way down the hill, if you deal with it wrong, uh, you'll start doing one of these responses. You see it here, right? You might just deny anything exists. In fact, one way to escape from conflict is just to pretend everything's okay. Let's pretend we're all friends. Uh, I never want to talk to that friend. This is the kind of friend I just never want to be with, but we'll pretend we're friends. The second one he calls flight, like going down the hill a bit more. It's not just pretending things are okay, but it's running away. Maybe you leave the house. Maybe you stop picking up the phone. Maybe it looks like ending a friendship, leaving a job, filing for diver divorce, changing churches. And sometimes, I mean, to be honest, sometimes running away is a right call. There's good reasons to pull yourself out of things. But most of the time, it's just running away because you're afraid of the conflict and you, you don't really know how to deal. That's escaping. The most, if you take it all the way to the bottom of the hill, the most extreme form of escaping, and I, I don't want to mention it, but the ultimate escape from conflict is suicide. And I mention this, if only because February is the highest month for suicide in the United States. Sometimes people commit suicide because they've lost any hope of living in this conflict. So they want to escape or make a desperate cry for help. In fact, suicide for a while now has been the third leading cause of death among young people in the United States. And Ken Sandy's theory, who studied this more than I have, his theory is that one of the reasons why suicide is such a big thing or a way of escape for especially young people is that they have not learned how to deal with conflict in a healthy way, which is heartbreaking, right? Like we've got to figure out how to deal with conflict. So this side he calls uh, peace faking. You see a conflict and you run away because you don't know how to deal with conflict. But some people do something different. And you can look on your diagram, the three responses on the right side, Ken calls attack responses. You know, this, for, for people who like this side, conflict can be fun, because you might be more interested in winning a fight than preserving a relationship. There are people who run a conflict and they love it, it is, he says, the default response of people who are strong and prideful or people who are weak and insecure. And sometimes like he uses the word assault. There it is. You ever notice some people take a little conflict and make it a lot worse? Like they go, okay, here's a molehill. Let me just build a mountain up, right? Uh, there are some people you, you encounter who make conflict a lot worse because they want to win by using various forms of force or intimidation. Sometimes it looks like a verbal attack, uh, gossip, slander. You're like, oh, what? Well, you know what he does, right? And, and there you go. You, you attack the person instead of the argument. Sometimes it will devolve into physical violence or slander or doing whatever you can to damage the reputation of a person. That's, that's fight. Or sometimes the next step looks like litigation and you can force people to bend to your will by taking them to court, which uh, I, I mentioned because this is the exact scenario in 1 Corinthians 6. You see the reference here. Uh, this is what's happening in the Corinthian church. The last one, the extreme one, is murder. That's, that's the, the bottom of the fight hill. 
which sounds really extreme, right? Because I, I don't think I know any Christians who would actually kill somebody when they're in conflict. But before you dismiss this and sort of laugh at that, never forget what Jesus says, that we stand guilty of murder in the eyes of God when we harbor anger or hatred or contempt in our hearts to other people. That's what Jesus says. And that is exactly what happens among Christians in conflict and is serious and dangerous. And and also point out, because Ken does, sometimes you end up at the bottom of the hill, like you end up at the attack, at the bottom of the attack hill for two different ways. Sometimes you naturally love fighting back and you just go there first. Other times people end up there because they've tried to run away. They've tried to, to deny things. They, they, they hold it in and you just, like, you can't ignore the problem any longer. So it just finds its way out from under the rug. It builds up and you explode and you attack. And you're like, who is this person? Uh, it's because this doesn't work. And look, I, um, I could probably tell 10, 15 stories from real life of people I've watched who reacted to conflict in one of these bad ways. Now, but you've got stories too, right? And uh, I'm giving you a lot of information really quickly, but if we had time to break out into discussion groups or something, I'll bet you could tell me about how much you've lost to conflict with family or at work or at school or at church. Like I'm not telling you a lot of stories in part because I just don't know which one to pick from. But think about how much energy you've wasted on conflict dealt with in unhealthy ways. Think about how much you've missed because you've run away and you're afraid to live life with people. Or when you didn't fight harder for better community. Like like folks, this this is huge. We need to figure out how to deal with conflict in a healthy way. Now, the good news is that God finds the not very hidden mess under the rug. God knows how to fix it. And I'm about to tell you some wise ways that the Bible instructs us how to deal with conflict. And if you could master some of these, you wouldn't have to be afraid of conflict. You would no longer have to either run away or fight back in harmful ways. If you could master this, it would make you, it would mean that conflict would make you a better person and in a stronger community if you could do what God tells you to do. So if you look at the chart again, the six categories on the top are called peacemaking responses. And these are all commanded by God. These are empowered by the Spirit and they have the goal of finding agreeable solutions. Uh, Let me just, I'm gonna give you a brief overview and just encourage you to to look this over when you have more time. The the first three peacemaking responses are called, or he calls them personal responses. And for a really simple reason, they're carried out personally, just you and the other party. And most conflicts, most arguments you're gonna have in life uh, should and can be resolved in one of these ways. The first one he calls overlooking an offense. Like here's the thing, a lot of the drama that you encounter, a lot of the disputes are just, they're so small that you could easily resolve it quietly and deliberately by consciously deciding to overlook it. Proverbs 19.11 says, a man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to, see what it says, overlook an offense. In this case, you don't really even have to talk to the person who offended you. It's going, look, I I am in my rights to be insulted right now. I didn't get invited to this thing. I didn't get consulted. I didn't get consulted. You didn't send me a card. Like I could decide to make a thing about this, but instead, I'm gonna overlook it. I'm not gonna cover it up. Overlooking an offense, and this is an important difference between this and denial. This is choosing to forgive. And it involves making a deliberate decision not to talk about it, dwell on it, or let it grow into something big like bitterness or anger. You can decide that I'm not going to be hurt even though there's a world in which this person hurt me. Number two is reconciliation. Sometimes 
you're going to be sinned against, you're going to be offended, and it is too serious to overlook because it has damaged your relationship. And you don't want it, like it'd be easy to fight back, it'd be easy to run away. Uh, what's harder and what's better is to reconcile. When, when someone's insulted you, when someone's offended you, God says what you need to do is resolve it for the sake of community by things like confession and loving correction and forgiveness. Jesus says, for example, Matthew 5, if your brother or sister has something against you, what do you do? Run away, fight back. No, 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 go be reconciled. Or Galatians 6, brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should what? Restore him gently. Or Colossians 3, forgive as the Lord forgave you. You, don't cover it up, don't run away, don't attack the person, talk it out, figure it out, reconcile. The next one, sometimes, uh, this is another scenario, sometimes uh, you can resolve relational issues, but you still got stuff to, you're arguing about. Uh, money issues, property, rights, something like that, so you got to talk it out, negotiation. And what the Bible says, when you're negotiating with somebody, among other things you should think about, remember what Philippians says. Each of you should not think only to your own interest, because you do that naturally, but also to the interests of others. Now, those are the three where you could work out just you and the other person, and you agree to work out the offense, you communicate, you fix miscommunication, you forgive insults, all that. And like, if you can do these three things, you end up closer on the other side of it, But sometimes it doesn't work. Now, here's what's amazing. Most people don't know this, but God's plan for the church is to help people in community find resolution. This is amazing. The first category that Sandy talks about is called mediation. And here's what you can do. Essentially, if you and someone else privately can't come up with a solution, here's what God says you could do. Here's an idea. Call in someone else for a third-party opinion. Matthew 18 says, if he'll not listen to you, uh, take one or two other people along with you. Get some unbiased advice. Uh, The second one is is like this, but it's a little bit more serious. Sandy calls this one arbitration. Essentially, if you and the other person try hard to work it out and you can't agree, here's an option. You can sort of arbitrarily appoint one or more arbitrators or, or a judge to, uh, and you decide, okay, you and I don't agree, but we're going to go with whatever this person says. Brings us to, to 1 Corinthians 6, where Paul says, here's how you resolve conflict. Verse 4, if you've got disputes about such matters, Paul says, here's what you do. Appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. In other words, just, just find somebody, find anybody, right? Go, you're a Christian, you're not related to me, you're not biased, it, me and him can't agree about this, but we can both agree that we'll do whatever you decide. That's arbitration, and it works. Last option in scripture is called accountability. If a person who claims to be a Christian refuses to listen to others and, and refuses to do what everyone agrees is the right thing, Jesus asks the church to formally intervene, to hold him or her accountable to Scripture and promote repentance, justice, and forgiveness. In Matthew 18, this is Jesus again, if he refuses to listen to others, tell it to the church. This is something we call church discipline, which is often viewed negatively because it's been misused in the past a bit. Uh, but when done the way Jesus instructs loving redemptively and restoratively, this can be the key to saving relationships through conflict from flight or fight. Now, I just, I just threw a whole lot of information at you, and I, I try and, uh, and I didn't give very many illustrations, and, and honestly, we could probably spend about a week on every single one of these categories, but here's the big picture takeaway. Please, please, please uh, digest this, think about it. But here's the fact, you can't avoid conflict. You're gonna misunderstand people, you'll be misunderstood. We're all sinners. Do you know what sinners do? They sin, <laughs> like we're gonna hurt people close to us. You're gonna have hurtful things done to you. It's inevitable. 
And you know what often happens? We just don't know how to deal with it. So we fight and we make things worse. Or we run away and we miss out on the community we didn't know how to fight for. What happens to lots of people who like, should be connected in a church serving well, lots of people don't get involved. They stop serving. They don't go to meetings anymore. They avoid any kind of accountability and they miss out on community. Do you know why? Because they haven't learned what to do with conflict. By the way, Sutter update. Um, I'm so happy we were healthy. Uh, the whole house was for about eight days. It was wonderful. But earlier this week, it was so sad. My kindergartner Jude woke up with a fever about 24 hours. Does everybody know what a fever is? I'm not a doctor, um, but I understand that a fever is when a human body is using all of its energy to fight infection. And it's just working really hard. Like you, you get a sweat from working hard at fighting things in here. Here's what I have noticed. Do you know what my kindergartner Jude can do while he has a fever? Not a thing. Like it's so sad. Like he sits on the couch, he's in a haze, not really moving, he's not, not really doing anything. And you take his temperature and you go, oh right, he's using all of his energy and resources and body strength fighting something right here. And uh, it, it's okay. About 24 hours later after uh, resting, his immune system beats a virus, I guess, and now he's back on his feet and using his hands, being a kindergartner. But here's the thing. As long as his body was fighting itself, all Jude could barely do was nothing. You ever wonder why the body of Christ isn't doing as much as it should? You ever look at the statistics at how many Christians there are in the world? Like there's a ton of us. And then you kind of notice how little Jesus seems to be doing to make our broken world better. I've got a theory for why that is. Here it is. I think that the body of Christ seems as lethargic and stagnant as it does because we're using all of our energy fighting ourselves. It's all on the inside. And as a result, people are overlooked. Causes are under-energized. The body of Christ is like, as it were, sitting on a couch with a thermometer in its mouth, watching the rest of the world go on because we have not yet figured out what God wants to teach us about dealing with conflict. And what God calls us to do is to deal with division, deal with personal arguments and differences and conflict in a God-honoring, gospel-glorifying way. So we can get better, right? So we can get off the couch, onto the field, and start making a dent for the cause of Christ in this broken world to be the body of Christ doing what God would have us to do. And all that might just start by learning how to solve personal conflict. Father in heaven, may you bind us together with a vision of your son. Your son who had every right to run away, who had every right to fight back, but instead chose to live among us to forgive us, and to love us. Can you bind us together in love, and may you use the healthy body of Christ to make a profound difference in this world. I ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.